Hello, everyone. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so very much for joining us today. Uh, we are now we are live at St. George University of London. And today we have Malcolm and Kate with us from the university. They will be taking us through the webinar. And also we have two guest speakers with us from the university to share their experience at SGRL. Trust me, this webinar will help you to understand this university better. Post this webinar, we will be having a Q&A round. Uh, so please feel free to post in your questions in the chat box. Uh, without further delay, I'll hand over this virtual stage to our speakers. Thank you. Over to you, Malcolm. Thanks a lot, Vinayak. Thanks a lot for the introduction. And great to meet you all. Um, great to speak to um, students and potential students in India. So my name is Malcolm Davidson from St. George's University of London. And I'm just going to um, share quickly um, the screen. Here we go. Just to confirm, can everyone see and hear okay? Okay, can you see and hear okay? Yep, looks good. Good, fantastic. The last thing you want is to give a presentation and then realize no one can see and hear it. So thanks everyone for joining today. I'm really excited to introduce St. George's University of London to you all. So just as a summary of the lineup today, you, you'll hear from me, Malcolm Davidson. I'm International Projects Manager for St. George's University of London. We have also Dr. Kate Everett Corn, a lady with many job titles, but two of those are Reader in Human Genetics, and she is also Deputy Head of the Graduate School for our taught programs, and also a former, former course director of our MSc um, Genomic Medicine program. We also are going to hear from Kiranjit Keta, who is a year three BSc Biomedical Science student, and Aditi Maske, who is a student from India who recently graduated from our MSc Genomic Medicine program. So you may or may not have heard of St. George's University of London. We're only just starting to be active in India, so you may not know us, but we are a university with a long and illustrious history. Um, we're quite unique in the sense that we are the UK's specialist health university. So the only university in the UK that only focuses on health sciences, medicine and, and uh, sciences as well. We're also part of a big group of universities. So St. George's University of London, the clue is in the name. We are part of University of London, which is um, a historical group of universities that includes some, some big names such as UCL, King's College London, other universities too, such as um, SOAS, Goldsmith, Birkbeck, um, Royal Holloway, um, lots of other universities too, and we're part of that group. And we're also quite unique too. I don't think there's any other university quite like St. George's in the UK in that we are a medical and healthcare specialist university, but we are co-located on the site of a major hospital. So St. George's Hospital, hence the name, um, is one of London's four largest hospitals uh, serving Southwest London and some neighboring counties too, and a major trauma center. And St. George's is located physically on the site of that hospital. So from day one, as a, as, a, as a medical healthcare life sciences student, you are immersed in that clinical environment. So the hospital is all around you. The hospital forms the backdrop to your studies. Another really amazing thing too, which I only just realized fairly recently, is lots of our staff, lots of our teaching staff are also healthcare practitioners still to this day. We even have some staff who will work, for example, two days in the hospital, and then they may teach, for example, three days a week at the university. So you are being taught by people who have real first-hand experience of the healthcare environment. Some impressive stats on St. George's. We're really proud that once again this year we, we've come number one as the number one university in the UK for graduate prospects. So really impressive employability stats for graduates of healthcare and life sciences. Also, you know, really, really fantastic history and sort of um, fantastic reputation for, for research. Research is a big part of what St. George's does. And in the 2021 Research Excellence Framework, we came top 10 once again um, for, um, for universities for research impact, and also ranked within the top 250 universities worldwide. As I mentioned, research forms a big part of what we do, and we have four research institutes, and those specialist areas would be uh, medical and biomedical education, infection and immunity, 
molecular and clinical sciences and population health. And when it comes to infection and immunity, again, a big part of what we do, um, for example, one thing we're really proud of is the recent work that St. George's did around the development of the COVID vaccine. Lots of research took place at St. George's, so that impact is still being felt uh, to this day. So a little bit about our history then. So we do have a long history. So the hospital itself, St. George's Hospital, was established in 1733. And the original site would have been in central London, around about Hyde Park. You've probably heard the name if you haven't visited London. Really famous large park in the centre of London. And from around about 1752, the, the hospital started teaching medicine to, to medicine students. And from there on, the, the university was born. So from over, over for over 250 years, sorry, uh, we have been teaching medicine to students. But the university has changed a lot since then. So from the early 1980s, the hospital and the university moved to its current site, which is in Tooting in southwest London. So it's gone from being a small hospital you know, 250 years ago to being one of London's four largest hospitals, as I mentioned. So really large hospital, um, major trauma centre. Also, I don't know, I don't normally mention this to international students, but only a couple of weeks ago, some international students mentioned it to me. Um, there is a TV show, a famous TV show called 24 Hours in A&E, which is, a, which is a, a sort of a reality documentary filmed about the daily life of a hospital. It's a long running documentary uh, broadcast on Channel 4 in the UK. You may find it online on YouTube, I don't know. But if you follow that documentary or you want to check it out, that is filmed at St. George's. As for the university, um, it's a really fascinating place to work and study. So I joined St. George's this year and previously I'd worked at a very large London university. Um, and I was really quite surprised when I joined St. George's. It's a small university, around about 5,000 students. The university I'd worked in before was around about 20,000 students. But I was just surprised at sort of how much how much of a a big university St. George's feels. It's a small university, but with a big university feel. I think being part of that hospital complex gives it that big university feel. Also fantastic facilities you would expect every university to have, fantastic library, IT facilities, lecture theatres. But again, being a specialist healthcare university, you also have access to first rate uh, facilities, labs, that you would expect to have. So for example, the, we have things like the simulation suites, the paramedic, um, paramedic science simulation suite, the radiography simulation suites, uh, clinical skills rooms, which you can see in the top right-hand corner. They are basically like, almost like real life hospital wards where you can practice your clinical skills in a safe environment. Um, in the middle there, you might see that that sort of red box, that is our anatomy museum. So we have a, an anatomy museum, which 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 contains medical specimens um, dating back over the years. Um, really, really a fantastic collection for your study of anatomy, as well as a di as medical dissection room as well. So medical dissection forms part of our medicine degree. But not only that, it also forms part of our biomedical science and physiotherapy degrees too. So I think that's something to be aware of. Being a being like a hospital, hospital, university, medical school, lots of our other healthcare programs have that extra medical edge to them that you may not find at mainstream universities. <laughs> Excuse me. Just to look at some of our alumni. So we have some really famous alumni going back hundreds of years. So you may have heard of, you may not have heard of these names, but you'll certainly know the things I'm referring to. So for example, you may have heard of Gray's Anatomy which is a seminal anatomy textbook. He is still used in teaching today. And Henry Gray was a, a renowned surgeon from history who was also a St. George's um, alumni, studied at St. George's. Edward Jenner also a pioneer of the modern vaccine. So the first modern vaccine, which I believe was for cowpox, was, um, was um, developed by Edward Jenner, who is also um, a St. George's alumni. And then lots of other names you'll see there on the screen too. These may not be household names, but you'll see many people, including people like Hannah Valentine, Sir Patrick Valance, um, Professor Sa Sanjay Sharma. These people are all St. George's alumni, and all people who have gone on to, to, um, to do really inspiring work and be majorly influential in the world of healthcare, health policy research globally. So, you know, St. George's alumni are making a massive difference in healthcare in the UK and around the world to this day. 
And this is one thing I find really inspiring about studying at St. George's. It's not just becoming a famous name. You know, even students that qualify as occupational therapists, physiotherapists, biomedical scientists, doing their daily job, you are, you know, entering into a career where you are going to make a massive difference and a massive impact, positive impact on people's lives on a daily basis. And it is really, that's what makes St. George's, I think, a really inspiring place to work and a rewarding place to work and a rewarding and inspiring place to study too. Just to touch quickly on St. George's as well, one thing, again, that I really, really enjoy about working at the university and one thing I see from the students is, as I mentioned, it's a small university, 5,000 students. And I think because it's a specialist healthcare university, the students are all sort of living, studying um, alongside each other. Everybody knows everybody. So there's lots of support. I think staff will know you on a first name basis. Students have said to me, it's a bit like school in a good sense, in the sense that you would know the students in the, in the years above you, below you, you'll know students in other courses. Many of our courses have shared modules. So for example, if you're studying occupational therapy, you probably share some modules with students on physiotherapy, because in real life, in the world of healthcare, you have to collaborate with other practitioners. So you really get a chance to know other students as well. One thing I've noticed too, and I'm speaking from experience here, having studied at a major London university and having worked at another London university, one thing about London universities is they can be a little bit impersonal. So after class, I find students will often disappear and they live their life in London. They don't necessarily spend their life on campus. But I've noticed that St. George's very active campus life, over 120 clubs and societies at the university, which I'm going to mention is double the number I've seen at other London unis, which are three times the size of St. George's. So you really can be assured you're joining like a very active, uh, supportive community of students. Just to mention quickly too, accommodation shouldn't be a problem for you either in your first year. We have our own facility, Horton Halls, and that is located just 15 minutes walk from the campus and 15 minutes walk from the London Underground. Um, all single rooms with private bathrooms, um, self-catering with a shared kitchen area. And we do guarantee accommodation to students as long as they apply by the 1st of July. That's first year students, by the way. And again, just some, some common feedback from our students. One thing I mentioned you know, already is the, um, the friendly nature of St. George's and helpfulness of the staff. That's feedback I hear a lot. Another thing too that we're really famous for, especially in, in medicine, when it comes to medicine, is um, St. George's graduates, I'm told, um, by the medical world, are famous for having excellent communication skills. And that is a big part of, of our approach to teaching medicine, physiotherapy, radiography, patient-facing courses. It's really important to us to produce graduates who have excellent communication skills and can provide excellent, empathetic, patient-centered care. So what can you study at St. George's? If that sounds interesting for you and you're looking for a course in the world of medicine and healthcare, we have a small, but I think quite diverse range of courses. So for the undergraduate courses, we have a range, we have life sciences, so biomedical science, clinical pharmacology, as well as allied health sciences and medicine. And for the postgraduate courses too, not going to dig into that too much. I will be handing over to Kate a little bit later who will explore those, but a really diverse range of master's programs too. <coughs> just to look now at our undergraduate programs then now naturally I know that medicine is going to be a big draw for many students just to be clear only for only for um only our undergraduate medicine program is open to international students it's a five-year program it is quite competitive we only have 19 places available for international students and I'm not going to dig into medicine too much today just to say we do run medicine webinars uh, throughout the year and we do really encourage you to visit the St George's site and sign up for those then but definitely studying medicine in a, in a hospital setting is I think it makes a lot of sense and if you want to find out more about medicine please do get in touch but really today I want to just focus on our other undergraduate programs which which are divided between life sciences and allied health. So our biomedical sciences program is, um, you know, it's a really big program. We have a lot of students on that every year. I think being a specialist healthcare medical university, um, it's an excellent place to study biomedical sciences. You're studying alongside medical students. You have access to lots of fantastic um, opportunities to sort of, you know, visit the labs in the hospital and many different specialisms that you can follow, such as anatomy, genomics, clinical bioscience, infection and immunity, and many others. 
Also, you have the option to take a placement year. So just to mention as well, every course has an employability um, an employability specialist attached to the course. So in Biomed, there is a member of staff who's fully um, dedicated to helping students with employability and finding placements. And being a specialist healthcare university, we have excellent relationships with a really wide variety of, of, of organizations, with NHS organizations, with research institutes, private companies. Um, so many fantastic um, placement opportunities for a Biomed student. And things you can do with Biomed, I think our student Kiranjit will, will be digging more into what Biomed is like at St. George's. But there's a lot of different routes you can take with biomedical science. So many industries you can enter with it. Some are quite literal. You know, you can go and work as a biomedical scientist um, in research labs in the NHS, or some students use it as a springboard to work in the commercial, commercial side of healthcare, perhaps the policy side of healthcare, and some use it as a springboard to, to move into professions like law, finance, and many other directions. But we're also quite proud too that 60% of our biomed graduates go on to further study after graduation. Many use that as a stepping stone to go on to graduate root medicine, dentistry, physiotherapy, other branches of biomedical science, such as, um, you know, biomedical science research, um, genomic technologies, um, genomic medicine, um, or further, further studies along the way, such as PhDs. Just to mention too as well, so clinical pharmacology, another really interesting course to investigate, um, which is a new course for us. So we, well, it started four years ago and we had our first graduating cohort this year, which meant we got our first rankings for the course. I'm really proud that in that short period of time, um, this course is now ranked as the top university for pharmacology in the Guardian Good University Guide for this year. Now, what is pharmacology? I think that's a common question we get a lot. It's not the same as pharmacy. Um, pharmacology is the study of all aspects of drugs as they relate to humans. So that's studying um, disease and how disease works, um, how drugs interact with different diseases, and also how drugs interact with the body. And this program as well, you might see um, lots of bachelors in pharmacology, but we are the only clinical pharmacology program. Often people ask, so what makes it clinical pharmacology? Um, and one of the answers to that is that this is a much more applied program that you may find elsewhere. So for example, a, a traditional pharmacology degree is usually quite theoretical. You'll spend a lot of time doing research. Um, you spend a lot of time in, in the labs and you do all of that on our program, but our program is probably a lot more applied than you might find elsewhere. So we'll do a really wide variety of other activities too, such as not just the research, but also looking at how drugs are developed, um, data analysis, presentations, how clinical trials are run, how you would put together a pitch for, for developing a new treatment idea, lots of really interesting extra things that you study on this course. And it was designed in tandem with employers in the pharmaceutical area. So designing the course that um, employers, designing this course to produce graduates with the kind of skills that employers really want. And there's also the chance to do um, extra research projects or an optional placement year. Just to jump forward a little bit, I know it is time to move on. Um, just to touch on our tuition fees then, some practical aspects. Um, so these are our tuition fees. So for medicine, it's around about £40,000 a year for international students. Our bachelor's programmes range between £18,000 to £20,250 a year. And then for the master's programmes, around about £24,000 a year. When it comes to scholarships, when it comes to scholarships, we do have a range of scholarships. So just to be clear, all of our master's programs have four scholarships each, which are competitive, they're not automatic, of £3,000 each. And there is a selection process on those. We have one full scholarship for international students for our master's in global health. Again, that's a competitive scholarship. And um, you would need to apply by the 5th of May for all of these, or is it the 1st of May? 1st of May, 5th of May, not much difference by early May. And also just recently announced, we have one great scholarship. The great scholarships are done in tandem with the British Council. And the great scholarship is a scholarship of £10,000. Again, that is competitive and merit-based. So one scholarship for a passport holder of India for one of our one-year master's programmes. And you can find out more information on our website about those scholarships. 
In terms of entry requirements, again, not going to go into too much detail on that right now. I can bring this back up later. Um, we accept A-levels. We also accept Indian Standard 12 to all of our bachelor's programs too. So um, also IB, US high school, US high school diploma, lots of different qualifications are accepted. And for our master's programs, you would need either, um, well, you need a bachelor's degree, that's equivalent to UK honors, but we do also accept Indian bachelor's degrees too. So at UK 2.1, we would consider around about 65% um, in a, of an Indian GPA and an Indian GPA of 55% for our for a UK 2.2. So um, I am just going to hand over now to Kate, who is going to speak a little bit about um, Actually, no, I'm not going to hand over to Kate. I'm going to hand over to Kiranjit, I think, who is going to give us a bit more of her experience of studying biomedical science at St. George's. Hi, Kiran, are you there? Hi, I'm just um, starting up my PowerPoint. So hi everyone, I'm Karen, and I'm currently a third year biomedical science student. I'm on the clinical bioscience pathway. I'm going to give you an insight of what it's like to be here at St. George's. So why did I choose St. George's? Well, as Malcolm mentioned, it's the only university in the UK to specialise in healthcare. And the benefit of that is that when you're in the library or you're in different societies, you get the opportunity to network and socialise from people with people from different healthcare roles. And this means even though you could be on one pathway, you might be interested in going into their clinical roles. For example, if you're talking to nurses, doctors, physiotherapists, physician associates, you just get an opportunity to get an insight with them. Another reason I chose St. George's is because they offer a unique clinical bio bioscience pathway this is unique to St. George's because no other university was offering this. And it gives you the opportunity to learn clinical skills, which is essentially how do you examine patients? How do you communicate with patients? In addition, you get to link this with clinical anatomy. The teaching of the modules was another reason I chose St. George's. This is because it makes it easier to link your knowledge across different modules. So for example, if you're doing a physiology module and you're learning about the cardiovascular system, you can expect the anatomy to follow with that and teach you about the cardiovascular system as well. And this just makes it a lot more easier for you to link together all the content and just to revise it as well. And another reason is the location is near central London. So the chief station is really close to St. George's. It just it's just a few stops away from some of the big hotspots like Leicester Square. And especially at this time of the year, they have Christmas lights. It's really nice to just give yourself a break and to go view it. You can even find new places to study there. There's loads of libraries across London, cafes. This is a great opportunity to explore. And another reason was the career support. So as Malcolm mentioned, there is a placement year. And this is really useful because if you take the placement year, it can actually give companies a chance to fast track you into a potential job when you finish your degree. And there's various placements you can take within big companies like GSK, or you can work in different universities. It doesn't have to be St. George's. You can go to any universities out offering research places. They also support you if you want to go outside of science. So there's some graduates who go into law, some in finance, there's no limits. And the career support will just be there to support you with the application and with exploring the options as well. So what do I enjoy the most? One of the main things is the flexibility to travel within London. I like exploring and having a big city with London, you will never get bored. There will always be new places to find new events, everything. 
you can explore with um, friends. You can go by yourself, find a nice studying place. It'll just give you a really nice break when you're stressed. Another reason I really like St. George's is because of the practical teaching of anatomy. When you come from A-levels or other courses and you jump into university, it can be a big jump because the content of university is a lot and the teaching is very different. It's very independent. But with St. George's, they give you lots of resources. So for something like anatomy, they give you your lectures and then they'll give you a practical aspect where you can engage with the cadavers in a dissection room. You have textbooks you can go to. You have 3D resources online. There's loads. They even, the library will give you study spaces. So you have rooms you can book with friends and you can make a study group. It's really nice. And it's a great way to meet other students when you come. The lecturers as well are very supportive. If you have any questions, you can just email them. If you're lost with the content, they are really supportive. I've sent loads of questions to lecturers and they always come back and they're happy to explain it and go over it. And that's, that's a key thing in university because it can be a lot of content and it can be difficult. So it's really nice to have that. And even on your well-being side, if you're struggling with anything, any issues, the lecturers are really supportive on that side as well. They can guide you to places you can go to and even just themselves. Um, as Malcolm said, it can be a small university, but because of that, you get to meet the other students there and you get to know them really well. So in a way, you make a family sort of network and you can fall back on that if you're struggling because you get this supportive um, sort of nature with them. And you can speak to them about, in a way, if you're, if you're struggling, you can essentially go to them and talk to them different years. I met loads of people through student ambassador work, student advisor, there's loads of jobs and roles and you can just meet different students on different courses and years. It's a great way. The other universities you'll notice the courses are so big and they have so many courses you don't get to meet other students and build that sort of relationship with them so it's, it's really nice and there's lots of societies as well that give you that opportunity to meet them and even societies they can support you with your career as well i joined the pediatric society and it gave me a chance to communicate with children work with them and I also got the opportunity to work in St. George's Pediatric a &E, which was great. That's something quite unique to be able to have a university and then have an on-site out hospital because you can link that and I get networks by going into the wards and working with doctors, nurses, various things. So I really enjoyed that. And another thing is student support services. So when you join university, it can be quite frightening and lonely. It's a new environment, but St. George's is really good. So if you're struggling, they will listen to you. They will just let you talk it out. And there's loads of support. Um, I think there's my main points. Thank you, Kieran. That was excellent. I, you've actually taught me a lot about the course things I didn't realize. I think that's amazing <laughs> just to hear that that you got to you know work in the, the the pediatrics lab in the hospital. That's a really specialist and really interesting thing. I didn't actually know that was possible for students. So thanks a lot for sharing today. Yeah. I think that's a really really good, really positive summary of the biomed course. And now we're going to hand over to. So that was our PG courses. We're going to hand over to Kate. <laughs> um, Kate okay, is just oh there she is. I'm uh, going to hand over to Kate who's going to cover our um, PG programs. Thank you very much, Malcolm and and Kieran. So let me just. Uh check that I can get my screen up as well. This is always the challenge. Um, uh, with me. So hopefully you can now see uh, that uh, slide talking about the master's programs um so possibly you can see the note the, the next little slide as well but that doesn't matter so uh thank you all for attending today and as malcolm said so my name is dr kate everett corn and one of my roles here at st george's is as deputy head of our graduate school 
Um, so that's the part of the university which oversees all our postgraduate taught programs, which I'll talk a little bit about today, um, but also our, our postgraduate research students as well. So our PhD and our MD res students as well. But I don't have responsibility for that side. There's another deputy head who looks after our research students. Um, I'm responsible for our portfolio of, of the taught programs that we offer um, and for all our students uh, on those programs. Uh, which is an ever expanding community uh, and a really, really diverse com community as well, which hopefully you'll sort of see as we talk through these. Um, so uh, we have, a, say, a range of programmes, which Malcolm has always already introduced you to uh, briefly on one of his slides. And they can be divided up in, into two general areas, really. And uh, first of all, we have what, what can be considered the healthcare conversion courses. So these are actually two year master's uh, programmes, which is a, a little bit unusual, perhaps. And there are professional or vocational courses. So they're training you to be uh, a specific um, profession within the healthcare services. So we have occupational therapy and physiotherapy, uh, which are pre-registration courses. Uh, and we also have physician association uh, associate studies. So you're training to be those specific, specific professions when you do those courses. Um, so those are open to applicants with uh, rather specific science or healthcare bachelor's degrees with, with a 2-1 or 2-1 equivalent with, with that or upper second. Um, so we might see people who have done perhaps biomedical science going on to these courses um, or they, uh, they might have done other similar sort of related degrees. So these are our two year ones, but I think what might be of particular interest uh, to the audience today are actually our one year master's programmes. And at the moment, there are a particular uh, group of seven programmes which I'd want to talk about. Um, this again, we have some uh, an expanding portfolio, so watch out for new courses appear, appearing on this list. But at the moment, there are these seven that I particularly wanted to mention. So we have clinical neuroscience practice, which is very exciting. That's a new program, which we're recruited to for the first time for the 2023 start. Um, we have genomic medicine, MSc, global health, MSc, sports cardiology, MSc. So these are masters of science and translational medicine, MSc. We also have two MRes or Masters in Research degrees, which are slightly different and I'll highlight how. And then also very, we're very excited that for September 23, we have starting our first MA degree, so Master of Arts degree in Medical Ethics, Law and Humanities. So still very much in that area of uh, specialism that we, we occupy here with the, the healthcare sciences um, and allied healthcare professions, but with a slightly different emphasis. OK, so what are these different degrees and what do they potentially lead to? Um, well, you'll hear a little bit more from Aditi in a bit, in fact, about uh, the MSc in genomic medicine. But the first thing that's quite unusual about this is that it's actually jointly taught with King's College London. So it is a St George's degree, but you'd get to experience teaching not just here in Tooting at St George's, but with our partners up at King's College as well, which are centrally based in a central part of London called Round London Bridge. So you get to experience the particular expertise at two different universities. Now, I'm particularly passionate with a bit of bias, perhaps, about this degree because I'm a geneticist. So this is my particular area. Um, and it's a fantastic degree that's been running about six years now and really looks to uh, educate our students in how genomics works across the whole of healthcare. Now, it's not just a specialist area, but it's something that anybody who works in healthcare really has to have an understanding of genomics. So it includes modules such as pharmacogenomics, uh, molecular pathology of cancer, but you can even do a counselling module as well. So it really is has got this sort of breadth to it, which is really quite fascinating. 
Uh, it's also got a range of students on it. Students come onto it from uh, a, a life science degree. They might come straight from that. We have practicing doctors on this degree as well and nurses. So again, the cohort is very diverse and the types of jobs that it leads to is quite diverse as well. So we have uh, graduates from this who've gone on to be clinical scientists to work in research. Uh, to work with data, which is a key part of all areas of science really as well, but also go on to do uh, medicine as well as then a further degree. Um, or if they're already practicing, they're taking that knowledge back into their work life and it really enhances uh, uh, their, their, their knowledge and uh, what they can give back in their job. So that's a very exciting uh, uh, degree, although as I, I say, I am a little bit biased. This, this next one, the MSc in Clinical Neuroscience Practice, I say we're very excited. This is a new one that's just been developed and we'll recruit this year for the first time. So this has been designed for psychology graduates and those doctors and nurses and allied healthcare professionals who are already working and are interested in uh, clinical neuroscience. Um, so it will involve clinical placements. Um, Typically a three month project, you'll see me mention this a little throughout, but it's also to highlight a difference between MSCs and MRESs, which I'll come to. And it really is for those people who want to have or already are stepping into a career in neurosciences, healthcare delivery, such that we produce practitioners who are real experts in this area. All of these, there are links to where you can find a bit more information on our website as well. Global health is something that we consider ourselves uh, to be real quite experts on as well. This has been a master's course that has been running for quite a few years as well. Uh, again, we see a really interesting range of students at this from um, students coming from uh, perhaps a, a degree in, again, sort of a bioscience or uh, more of an ethics background, but also, again, medics, uh, medicine degrees. We've had members of the, of the services on this course, lawyers, huge range. Um, and they can focus in a number of different pathways, as well as doing general global health. And hopefully you can see from this that uh, it covers some really interesting areas. So students uh, can focus on global health and conflict or with mental health or global health, ethics and law or with infection and immunity. So a, a real range, depending on your interest, you can build on a set of core modules and specialise. Um, we have quite a lot of international students interested in this degree and coming on board to do that. And sometimes they actually do their projects abroad as well. It's something we're trying to develop in other courses actually is more students doing their projects abroad if we can support that. We find that our graduates of this particular programme go on to work in policy making, for example, humanitarian relief maybe working for non-governmental organizations, NGOs. So again, a whole range of areas bringing their particular expertise into that field. Following on from that, I just want to highlight this second of our new programs, because there's a bit of an over overlap with certain areas of global health on the ethics side of things and the legal side. So this is our MA Medical Ethics, Law and Humanities. Uh, where students will focus on medical ethics and law, medical history, medical humanities and, and the future of medicine ethics in particular, um, but then will be able to build their option, optional modules on top of that, again, focusing on things that particularly interest you so that we give students that flexibility. So again, humanitarian work maybe and the ethics surrounding that, um, or some really quite interesting sort of more humanities modules, such as things like imagining the other, um, where we're, we're working again potentially with some partner universities to deliver this. So that's a really interesting new degree, uh, which I say starts next autumn for the first time. And again, I would imagine we'll be seeing on this students from really quite a range of backgrounds who then want to go on to do a range of careers, maybe advising on medical ethics uh, within healthcare practice, for example, or we'll probably find that we have medical students or sorry, uh, practicing doctors coming on this course who want to specialize in medical ethics and build up again their expertise and feedback back, back into the workplace. So that's a really exciting new development that we have there. Um, 
flipping them back to something really quite specific is uh, uh, the our MSc in sports cardiology, which again really builds on an area of uh, sort of expertise that we have across the university and across the hospital here. We have a number of our professors in cardiology who um, are the advisors on big events like the London Marathon, and they work with the with rugby. Um, teams as well, all sorts of things like that, to work with the elite athletes uh, to monitor their cardiovascular system and do uh, evaluation of these things. So they're real experts for this. So most of the students on this course are doctors already, but we do have some who aren't. The key thing here is actually you need to be able to interpret an ECG in order to get on the course. But typically, as I say, these, these are doctors who are wanting to specialise not only in cardiology, but in particular in this uh, dynamic area of sports cardiology. So, again, it's a really exciting thing to do and it is, um, allows our students, our graduates of the course, to go off and be uh, world experts in, in this area. Um, and then um, let's talk a little bit about translational medicine, uh, which, again, is a really exciting area of, of science at the moment and really is about how we can use those breakthroughs in science and push them straight into clinical practice. And that is that translational part. It's how do we get these things into practice very swiftly? So we might be talking about drug development or clinical trials, but we're having students there within that who also under, understand the science of this uh, sufficiently to be able to then translate that into healthcare. Um, so again, this, this uh, has a number of taught modules, but then a three month research project as well. And our graduates from this program have been really successful about uh, then getting jobs in uh, the pharmaceutical industry, in both research and development, uh, again, working with uh, data at a really uh, really impressive uh, institute in, in London, the UCL Cancer Institute, which some, some have gone on to do PhDs as well. And again, we've had students on this who've not just come fresh from undergraduate degrees, but are perhaps clinical academics. Uh, and uh, so that's doctors who work uh, in research as well, who are wanting to really enhance their knowledge in this area and then take it back into their practice. So again, you can perhaps see with uh, all of our programmes, so there's a real overlap between science and the healthcare and the practice of all of these things and bringing it together holistically. So uh, I mentioned that we also have MRes degrees. So those ones I've just mentioned are basically one year full time MSc, where there a large proportion of the degree is taught. And then you have typically a three month project. The difference to the MRes degrees is that the MRes degrees, Masters in Research, uh, have a much bigger project. So um, it's basically a nine month research project. There'll still be a couple of taught modules which typically focus on research skills. Um, but then the emphasis is really on the research project. And most of the students on these courses, the MRes courses, are thinking about going on to do a further research degree, a PhD, and move into that as a career, into a research career. So um, I mentioned the MSc in Translational Medicine just before. You could also do an MRes in Translational Medicine if you want to do less of the taught modules and more research. You could do the MRes in Translational Medicine. Um, but we also have an MRes in biomedical science. And again, we have a range of pathways on this, depending on what students are interested in. So whether that's cancer, we have antimicrobial resistance, which is a really important global issue, likewise infection and immunity. And then there's also a pathway in reproduction and development. And your project would align with that pathway. So you can really pick up some uh, great skills in that area that perhaps then you take on to um, the PhD. But some students, again, decide not to actually go on to a PhD, but get a job potentially in sort of a biopharmaceutical industry in research and development. So uh, that's the the last of um, of the slides that I have on that. I'm just going to try and bear with me whilst I bring back the main. Thank you, Kate. Okay. That was a really fantastic overview of our PG 
um, PG programs. Um, I'm just also going to share in the chat here, we have a postgraduate um, open evening next week, actually. So that is, I think that's five, four or 5 p.m. UK time, I believe. Um, but I put the link in the chat. Hopefully you can view that. And if you want to find out more about our PG programs, you can join our virtual open evening next week at St. George's and speak to our professors. And finally, we're going to hand over to Aditi Maske, who is a recent graduate on our MSc Genomic Medicine program. And Kate was her teacher, I believe. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, so hello, everyone. My name is Aditi. I'm from New Delhi. And in August this year, I completed my master's in genomic medicine from St. George's. Uh, today, I'll speak briefly about my experience uh, as an international student at St. George's last year and in general through about the London experience. So uh, I already have a degree in microbiology from the University of Pune in India. Uh, but after that, I was always working in genomics. Uh, so I worked in Delhi for two years at the Genomic Research Institute in Delhi. And so I was always about like passionate about uh, genetics and genomics. So that's how I uh, wanted to do a degree in it. And that's how I found this course jointly taught at St. George's and King's College London. And after carefully like looking at the modules taught in this course, I was really impressed the way it was structured. Uh, and the modules, uh, they covered literally every aspect of genetics and genomics of various diseases, the new genetic technologies, pharmacology, and uh, uh, genetic counseling, ethics, and many other things. Uh, so the, the course starts with uh, a basic module of fundamentals of genetics and genomics, like brilliantly taught by our dearest Kate here. And uh, the module like sets, like gets you ready to do the uh, other modules in the course. This is a, it's a basic module to, as Kate mentioned that uh, genomic medicine, it's a, the cohort is like very diverse, a group of nurses, doctors, uh, people like me from life science background. So the course really, it's a kickstart to the module. The, this module is like a kickstart to the course. And I really enjoyed it because uh, I'm a very, data science enthusiast person and uh, worked in bioinformatics before. I also enjoyed all the bioinformatics course taught uh, at St. George's and also at King's uh, in this course. And I also did my project in bioinformatics, uh, which was also very exciting. And uh, yeah, as an international student, I feel uh, I always felt supported uh, like with everything, like I've made the best connections here with uh, in terms of like friends, mentors, anytime if you need any help, you can uh, email the concerned person and I'm, I'm sure they, they get back to you and you get your problems sorted. Uh, I can understand as being an international student, it's sometimes it, it's overwhelming to go to a new city and uh, be in a new setting, uh, make friends and everything. It can be overwhelming, but uh, I I'm, I'm sure at St. George's, you will always find people with similar interest and uh, with everything. And you can go to any of the teachers and uh, they will lead you and support you in the best they can. So, yeah. And in, in terms of because this course is like jointly taught at St. George's and King's, uh, I feel you get best of both the unis uh, at St. George's. and for me, I mean, I've spent all my time in the library sitting in the St. George's because I used to live in the student accommodation, which is uh, like a 15 minutes walk from the university. So I've spent, it's a fast paced course. So most of your time would be spent in sitting in the library, working on the assignments and preparing for the exams. Uh, at the same time at King's, it's in central London. So you get to uh, like ha have that experience as well. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, I've had loads of fun last year because then it's London. So yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you very much, Aditi. Um, I really love to hear, hear your experience and that you've enjoyed the course so much and that it's been so beneficial to you. Um, always fantastic to hear from our students and hear from you exactly just, just um, your experience. So um, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank so you. I guess we're coming to the end of this session. We have just a few minutes left. 
<laughs> um, I've shared with, with Vinayak, um, our host, a couple of links. One is for our postgraduate open evening, and one is about our postgraduate scholarships. So Vinayak, I don't know if you can, but great if you can share that with the viewers who are following us on YouTube right now. And do we have any questions? Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you for the uh, insightful session. Yes, we do have a couple of questions waiting for you in the chat box. So oh, I'll, I'll start taking it for you. Yeah. Uh, so the first question for you is, uh, are professors available for research with students? I mean, if there is something that students need help with professors, so our professor, professors are there to help them post the classes. Um, so it's breaking up a little bit. Um, but from what I understood, you're asking if, if professors are there to support students, if they have any questions. Yes. Yes, I mean, that would probably be a better question to ask one of our students, Kieran or Aditi, or even Kevrit, uh, Kate Everett, because Kate is um, a professor herself. But um, from what I understand, um, from the feedback I've had from students um, is that everyone is very available. I think, as I mentioned earlier, being a small university, everybody knows everybody. And I think everyone's quite easy to get hold of. But Kate, I see you've appeared. Do you want to answer this question? Well, just to say that certainly from my point of view um, as an academic, yeah, I mean, I will always respond to any uh, emails sent by students. And I think also to emphasise that we do also have a personal tutor system. So all students will have a personal tutor who they can meet with and who will uh, is there to supply and provide sort of additional um, sort of pastoral support throughout their time on the course and to point students in the right direction of anything they might need. So um, I would hope that uh, we we provide good support and as I say, respond to students uh, on a timely basis, which is what we try to do. Thank you. Vinayak, any more questions? I'm really sorry, Malcolm. There was some internet issue here. I, was, okay. I just fixed it up. It can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yeah. Yes. So uh, the next question we have is, what is the admission criteria at SGL? How do you select applicants and what expects in, in for an application? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think it depends a little bit on the course. And it's something I would have liked to have given a bit more time to today, but we can't cover everything in just one hour, sadly. Um, so I think leaving things like medicine aside, for our more standard courses, for things like biomedical science, clinical pharmacology, you would need to submit an application through UCAS, and that would have either your achieved grades from high school or, for, for, for example, your predicted grades, personal statement as well. Um, if necessary, you might need to submit an English uh, certificate too, like such as IELTS, although just to mention standard 12 English, is accepted as long as you have 75% or above, we will accept that in place of IELTS. So that's quite a straightforward application. If you're looking to do a patient facing course, that might be something like physiotherapy, occupational therapy, you would do all of everything I just mentioned. So submit an application through UCAS, but you would also need to do an interview. An interview is part of the application process because of course it's a course where you're going to be working with patients hands-on in a healthcare environment those patient facing courses, actually 50% of those programs you spend on placement working with the public. So we just need to be sure that you have the right mindset and attributes and that you really know what a, a career in healthcare really looks like. But for, for the more classroom based courses, more lab based courses, such as biomedical science, pharmacology, and then a lot of the master's programs that Kate mentioned, such as MSc genomic medicine, global health, sports cardiology, um, they would be a straightforward application either through UCAS or in the case of our master's programs, the application is through our website. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you for answering this. Uh, the next question is pretty much the same. Uh, what are the entry requirements for BSc and what is the salary package post the graduation? Does SGL entertain state board or CBSC boards for students from India? So yeah, a number of questions there. Okay, so going back to the first part of that question, that was the actual entry requirements. Yes, I would. I would, I don't quite have time to think to get the slide back up on the screen, but um, for if, it, if it's standard 12, 
I know that for medicine, it's around about 90% total. For physiotherapy, it would be in the standard health about 80%. And then the other programs round about 72, 75% on average. For most of our bachelor's programs, you would need to have preferably chemistry and biology. Although for physiotherapy and occupational therapy, we don't stipulate chemistry and biology, but for the other ones, probably it would be helpful to have chemistry and biology, if not mandatory. Naturally for biomedical science and medicine, you need both of those subjects. The second question was around, around about salary package. That is very difficult to answer because, you know, we are number one university in the UK for graduate employment. I know from personal experience, we offer excellent support, a specialist uni with, you know, fantastic relationships with external organisations and placements in London. Um, so I can't give you an exact figure. I probably would, would do a bit of online research on that yourself. And as a university, we can't guarantee, we can't state figures because we can't guarantee. It's also on the student too to take the opportunities that, that, that we can provide to students. But um, but yeah, I, I all I can say is that I have been quite reassured by when I've spoken to our students and our graduates, the kind of roles they're finding. Um, they seem to be um they seem to be able to find roles that meet what they're looking for and in, in quite a diverse range of interesting, interesting professions within the, the sphere of healthcare and medicine. So that was a rather long answer. And then the final question you asked was around the, the boards. Yes, we we can accept all boards as, as far as I'm aware. Thank you. Uh, then the, the the third question we have is how much UCAT score is required? Uh, I mean, ah, I okay, that's a really good question. And if you're thinking of applying for medicine, the UCAT is a big is a big is a big part of that. Really, you know, so you can be an excellent student. You can be, I would say, you can be a student that gets three A stars in your A levels, but that's meaningless if you can't perform well on the UCAT test and in the interviews for, for med school. Um, so the UCAT score, just to be aware everybody, if you're thinking of applying to med school for next year, um, so the application deadline has passed. So that would be 15th of December next year for 2024. UCAT scores for, for universities probably go up and down every year. So last year, our minimum UCAT score was 2,700. But our UCAT score is only ever based on the quality of applications we get. So, for example, the last three years, we've had a very, a very kind of strong cohort of applicants. So that meant our UCAT score has gone up year on year. And last year was 2,700. So um, we are kind of, I would say, um, that's a fairly high UCAT score. But I would say my advice to all students is if you're thinking of applying to med school, do your UCAT, look at the score you get, and then research previous year's UCAT um, of of all the med schools and choose universities that are within that same region. So if your UCAT score is 2,400, look for med schools where the UCAT, UCAT cutoff last year was around about 2,400 or below, and you're likely to, you're more likely to be invited to an interview. If your UCAT score is, is 2,900, then yes, probably St. George's would be a really safe choice to choose because last year we were 2,700. I hope that makes sense. But just to say, it, the UCAT score will always depend on what the previous year's cohort of applicants was like. So that's how we set it. We don't set a minimum. It's almost like the applicants inform what the minimum is. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, are the classes lecture-based or it's more about discussion? Um, I would... If Kate is around, I would call on Kate to kind of chip in on that question. I think you probably know better than me. Uh, yeah, so uh, depends on on the course, but um, basically they're very varied. So uh, if you consider um, the big undergraduate courses that perhaps we're talking about with medicine and biomedical science, but also clinical pharmacology, um, there will be uh, some lectures, so some large lecture based uh, learning but there will also be a range of small group learning as well. So where you might be in groups of 10 students perhaps and uh, working through a particular problem or scenario. Um, clinical pharmacology and biomedical science, of course, have the, the labs as well, where you perhaps there's a large group of students in the lab, but you're working in partners, in pairs. So we use a range of uh, teaching approaches and um, uh, as you go through the degree, and certainly, and if we were talking then the postgrad courses, um, but in the final year of undergrad as well, um, there will be more sort of um, 
uh, sort of groups of students of perhaps 40 students where you have the opportunity to a bit be a bit more interactive bit more discursive um, some of the one of the modules I offer for example as well we have maybe journal clubs we maybe have some computer-based sessions so we like to use a nice range of, of teaching styles Thank you, Kira. I think that's the that's the perfect answer for them to understand this better. Uh, the next question we have is: uh, uh, Is it required to go for the language test if I have scored good marks uh, in my last three years of school? So, do they need to go for IELTS or something for a language test? Uh, uh, if... No. So, if you if you're applying for a bachelor's degree and you have your standard twelve English seventy five percent or above, and that was taken in the last five years, then you wouldn't need to um, do an IELTS for any further exam. But if it's older than five years or below seventy five percent, then yes, you would need to take an English test. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, I think the last question we have is: uh, Do we need to come to uh, SGL campus for a final interview, or we can give it online? Yep, of course, if you're located overseas, you can do any interviews you need to do online. So um, they would be done over video. If you want to come to campus just to do an interview, you're very welcome to. <laughs> but probably it's it's cheaper and more sustainable to do it online from the comfort of your of your home. Uh, thank you, Malcolm. I think uh, thank you. Great questions. Thank you. All, all the questions. Uh, uh, then, I mean, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Aditi. And thank you, Kiran, for giving us your time. Uh, it was a really insightful session. Uh, and thank you, all the students, for joining us today. Uh, if you have any kind of questions, please feel free and connect to the nearest SIUK office. And to know more what coming next, do follow us on our Instagram social media handles. And do share this video with your friends and family so that they get to know more about SGO. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Martin, everybody. Kate, uh, uh, last, uh, I mean, if you have a closing note for the students. No, just thanks, everybody, for, for um, attending today. And really, you know, we're a small university. You're, you're welcome to reach out. You know, we can offer that personal approach to anyone who's interested in um, learning more about St. George's. Happy to connect you with, with the particular sort of course leader or course team of the course you're interested in. Um, so look forward to hearing from you. Absolutely. Just thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And as Malcolm says, we're always happy to hear from people. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Malcolm.